Welcome back to the Ignite podcast. Today, we're delighted to have Philippe Noel from Parade DB on the show. Uh, Philippe, would love to get an intro from you for the audience. Hey, thanks for thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Philippe. I'm one of the founders and CEO of Parade DB. Parade DB is a real time search and analytics database on Postgres. Um, very technical infrastructure piece, but I'm happy to get into the details of what all of this means. Um, before that, I'm originally from Quebec City. I went to Harvard for university, and I actually ran a startup before Parade DB. So this is now my Harvard. Our second. Is that company. a college up in Canada? Uh, <laughs> close, close. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I'm actually but, Canadian uh, yeah. myself, so we got that in common. Uh, Always uh, love chatting with more Canadians. I'm, technically, I was born in Seattle, but uh, my mom was Canadian, so I got the dual citizenship. So when uh, when the fiscal oh, yeah, crisis, in Canada though. I've, I mean, I've been, I I used to go all the time, but I've never lived there. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'd go up all the time for family reunions and all that. But yeah, t t tell us, walk us through the uh, the in inception of Parade DB. How? What was the genesis of that idea, and and company? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Um, so, so uh, as I said, I was running a, me and my co-founders were running a, a company before, it's something different, and then we shut it down. And after we did, we were kind of, that was, that was at the beginning of 2023. And after we did, we were kind of wondering, you know, what to do next. We were trying to figure out where to, you know, what to get for jobs and so on. So we started doing contracting gigs with various, various companies just to sort of get ourselves out there. Like we've been doing the same thing for several years and, you know, we wanted to see what the options were in a sense. Um, and so we started building software for a variety of companies in the supply chain world, the procurement world, sustainability world, like various things at more industrial companies that we had connections with. And as we did, we um, a lot of the applications we needed to build, we realized there was like a need to do real-time search and analytics on the data that typically companies had living in Postgres databases. Um, for those that are not familiar, Postgres is uh, one of the main types of databases that power a lot of applications people use today, and it's one that's growing in popularity massively um, over the last the last couple of years, like five, six, seven years. And there was just no good way to do you know search and to do analysis over that data easily. Uh, you know, people we had to like move it to separate systems. There's a lot of problems that come when you need to do that and move data from security, performance, reliability issues, and we just thought this was a bit silly, really, that this was not a problem that was solved. And so we decided to kind of look more into it. And when we realized, you know, no one had done it and we thought we thought we could and it applied to our strengths and interests, we decided to kind of go for it. And so around the middle of, of last year in 2023, uh, we started building Parade DB. And the first thing we built was the ability to do full text search, like to do search over data in Postgres at a really high, really high caliber. And that kind of got us started. And so what, um, so I, I love this, this background, right? You, you kind of, you shut down this last startup and we should talk about that. Um, I just had another founder on the, on the pod earlier this week. I just launched the episode today where he spent four years, you know, trying to find product market fit and finally shut it down. And it was a really interesting story, but instead of jumping it right into another startup, you said, Hey, let's go build some stuff for other people, uh, as a contractor and, and kind of see what's out there and see what people need. And then you came, uh, you came across this idea and tell, tell me why it was the right time for this idea. Like what was the kind of technological, uh, breakthrough? Was it like something that just burst on the scene all of a sudden that, that enabled this, this new kind of, uh, technology? Yeah, it was, um, like from a technical perspective, I would say there's a lot of things that we're leveraging from the open source ecosystem that make it possible. And it would not have been possible to do a few years ago. Um, as far as like why now versus last year, I think you probably could have done it, you know, a few months ago or a year ago. Like it takes some time for people to notice, you know, the ideas. But for the most part, like each of the components that I described are very difficult to build. A database, so we're building a database, right? And a database has multiple layers, kind of like a layer cake, right? And the sort of universal wisdom that was in vogue over all of the 2010s was that to build a powerful database, you needed to build each layer yourself, like properly aware of each other layer, and they would form you know, the full database together. And that was massively difficult endeavors. And so to do that, companies would raise tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. They would work tirelessly for five, six, seven years before even releasing a product. And um, what people realize over, over the time period is actually a lot of people building database for various types of applications. We're kind of rebuilding many similar pieces, right? 
maybe in those six layers that form a database, there's only one that you specifically need to innovate on in your product, right? And so there was this growing idea that maybe if you could, you know, isolate each component, we could build in the open with the contribution of many companies and many, many people. And then when somebody creates a new database, they could remake certain parts that they want to be different for their use case, but also use existing parts and drastically reduce costs and time to ship. Um, and that's very much the case for us. Like if we had to build everything from scratch, this would take five years, but thankfully, um, all of the, you know, amazing people have done amazing work and we're able to do, you know, pretty exciting things in a matter of a few months. Thanks to. So it thanks sounds to like this. what you're describing here is it's, it's an open source stack, a new, a new kind of, uh, Postgres database that's open source. Is that right? Yeah. So Postgres itself is open source. Many of the, com of the other components that we, that we, you know, augmented with our open source as well, but, but even beyond that, like there were, there are many open source databases that are not built on this model of extensibility. So even though they're open source, you can't just say, I want to take this specific component and replace it with something else. This like a whole movement of extensibility that grew over the last, the last decade. And, and that's in large part thanks to this that we're able to do our work today. So, uh, so digging into the technical weeds a little bit more for the audience, um, you know, t tell us how it works. Sure. So, so what we do is we use Postgres, which is a pretty standard, um, like a very, as I said, a very popular database choice. Um, Postgres has basically two main flaws that we solve. Um, the first one is, is it doesn't have the ability to do very high quality search queries. So, you know, the ability to try to retrieve data based on natural language and different languages, um, with different types of complex constraints. These are things that people will use, um, existing tools in the market, like Elasticsearch or, or Algolia or the like that maybe you've heard if you're interested in the infrastructure world. Um, and we augmented with the ability to do that. So we maintain this sort of, it's something called an inverted index that we maintain inside of our version of Postgres. And we use the data that is inside of Postgres to make it searchable via this inverted index technology. That's one of the things we do. Um, the second thing we do- Inverted, is, inverted, uh, let's dig into that. What's an inverted index? And then, yeah, an inverted index is essentially this type of data store in a certain way, right? That allows you to easily tokenize data um, so that you can search it. So when you go on Google, right? When you go on Google, for example, you might search based on keywords. Like you might type, I don't know, like, like. Ignite podcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ignite podcast, right? Yeah. Like Google needs to be able to retrieve that information and then match it with some amount, you know, some data that they have classified in some ways, right? So at a very high level, I would say, uh, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a, uh, of a simplistic, uh, comparison, but at a high level, it's similar. So when you go on your database, you want to do search in that way. You want to be able to have an easy way to find through your data, things that have been sort of pre-classified so that you have, you know, you have faster searches and the sort of standard technology used for this is something called an inverted index. It's used universally in the industry. Um, and what we do is we bring um, the specific type of inverted index in Postgres so that we can make search queries faster and more powerful. Interesting. Okay. So it's basically traversing the database, creating this inverted index, which is a tokenization of the contents of the database, which enables faster searching. So instead of having to crawl through the entire database, which is kind of slow, it can kind of jump right to the right kind of spot in the database to retrieve the data. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good summary. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. So what was the next thing you were going to say? What was the second part of it? Yeah. And the second part of what we do is something called real-time analytics. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the softwares you use, they have some component of, of real-time, like things will need to update very rapidly based on the state of the world, right? Like an inventory in an e-commerce site might need to update quickly. So two people don't purchase the same product. If you have, you know, an attack on a, like a cybersecurity attack on a company, people want to be alerted very quickly that there's, you know, invalid requests that are being sent on one of their machines, right? So then they can react. Or when you serve ads, right, as a company, you want the ads to be relevant to the customer that it, that is placing there. So there's some amount of real-time aspect that comes to it. This is oftentimes associated with real-time analytics. So the ability to aggregate and infer trends from some amounts of data very, very quickly, right? And um, this is something that we bring into Postgres. So Postgres is a great database. It's mostly used for quick retrieval, 
like fast, like quickly retrieving data from it. Let's say you log into yeah. your bank account. You want to, you know, they want to retrieve the amount in your bank account to display it on the page for you, right? Or like the, num- you know, the mails that you might have in your inbox, right? Things like that. And how, how um, does how does Postgres store data versus like something more like a kind of a standard uh, relational database? How, so does Postgres, it store it in a particular way to, to allow for the fast retrieval? What's the kind of that kind of so secret Post- sauce? Because I remember, yeah, so you know, 10 years ago, we migrated one of our analytics tools internally. It was actually customer facing as well. Um, from a standard SQL da- database to to Postgres. And it just it was like 10x faster, I remember. But I didn't know how I don't know how it works. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you yeah. can explain so, f- for me and, and for the audience. Sure, sure. So, so just just to clarify a thing, um, Postgres is a relational database. It's a pretty standard relational database. Maybe what you might have migrated is from uh, MySQL. Yeah. Many people mi- migrate from MySQL to Postgres. There are two relational databases. Postgres is sort of the up and coming one. Um, but that's what um, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so the way it does it, so Postgres, like all relational databases, store data in rows. You can think of it as like an Excel spreadsheet, if you will, right? Each row in your Excel spreadsheet is is like a row in Postgres. And when you want to find data, you will essentially put you will essentially ask Postgres like find me this row or these rows and then you get information inside of them. Um and for a variety of reasons, Postgres is optimized for this type of row based system and is optimal in that way. Um when you talk about analytics, Typically, analytics is done in a slightly different way, more over the columns in the database, over the rows. So instead of searching, you know, row one, two, three, you might want to search all the content of column one, two, three, right? So an example is typically rows will be, let's say, you know, different user IDs and the columns might be like content of the bank account, right? Or number of mails. Attributes to the user, like their address, their, you know, their last login date, whatever. Exactly. And so you might want, for example, in the login date, say like give me a graph of all the logging dates of the re- you know the breakdown of the or log- histogram the log- of like dates. when people log into the system because i'm built, spinning up infrastructure so i need to know hour by hour on average exactly. when people log in stuff like that yeah exactly and that's something that relational databases are not really optimized to do because they prioritize this type of row based system and this example we're just talking about is more inherent to a column-based system. And so what, mm. what the second thing we do with, with PerdB is we allow, we recommend Postgres to have the ability to do column-based uh, type of, of, of workloads. And in that way, we enable the ability to do this real-time uh, analysis over the, the data inside of Postgres. And that's very useful for companies because typically Postgres is where they, their data lives. If they want to build some examples of the, you know, the workload that I was talking about before, it might yeah. be a combination of searching through that data, retrieving the data for a specific user, and then doing analysis over all the X attributes of that user for a certain period of time, for example, right? And they yeah. use this to say, this is the ad that should be displayed. Or here, here's a, a histogram of the recent X events that have happened in your bank account or in your inbox, right? Like those things need a combination of the two workloads. And today, uh, people need to use multiple different systems to do this because there's just no system in the Postgres ecosystem that, that does both. And ParadeDB is trying to be that system that offers them analytics really in, inside of Postgres. I love that. So I'm thinking of the game Battleship, you know, the game Battleship mm-hmm. and you're, you know, like B, B2, you know, like hit, you know, B3, miss. And so like my SQL is kind of basically going row by row into the, to the column and just grabbing the data one at a time. But Postgres is what it sounds like it's doing and, and Parade DB is like, it can go to the row, yes, but it can also g- grab a bunch of columns all at once. Or it could, it could actually, instead, it could, it could actually go down the column itself. Is that, is that a, a good analogy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would, I wouldn't say that, that my SQL is not able to do this. Like it's also a very capable system. And it, in a lot of ways, it's feature parity with Postgres. It's, it's used at a very high scale, but, um, some of the, like relational databases typically don't work based on columns. They work based on rows. You can do multiple rows at the same time. And there's multiple optimizations for both. Like we're all talking in, in pretty high level terms here. But um, yes, some of the optimizations we bring is the ability to handle columns more effectively. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So um, so tell us about your kind of your go-to-market strategy and, and how you're acquiring customers and um, who your ideal customer profi- profile is, stuff like that. 
Yeah, good question. Um, happy to. We well, our ideal customer profiles is people who um, who run Postgres at the heart of their data stack, right? So there's multiple types of databases in the world. Um, typically, people are pretty opinionated about the database they pick, and once they pick a primary database, it's a very important foundational block in their data infrastructure, and it's not one that they're going to to change. And so, when we have customers that choose to pick Postgres, then we become, you know, a very good option for them because we're also a Postgres-based product and it's easier to integrate with their system. And we kind of set aside people that use MySQL or other types of tools like MongoDB. So we focus on Postgres as our ICP, specifically people that need to serve real-time analytics, people that need to build observability solution, customer-facing dashboard, ad serving, for example, like personal personalization engines, things like that. Um, mm. Typically are the main people that will go and, and use PerdB. Um, as far as our, as far as our go to market, we're an open source company. We we're going with bottoms up developer adoption. So what this means is really, we try to make something really, really good and to just tell people about it online. That's, it's what? like very, it's very <laughs> simple, right? Um, I love that. It's, it, it's a bit simplistic, but like early on, we find that developers, it's very hard to sell developers. Typically they right. want to be able to see something. You know, you want to download get, it, uh, pull it, mess around with it, try it. Exactly. And yeah. And that's exactly. why open source works so well for, for kind of infrastructure layer kind of companies, right? Tell us a little bit exactly. about how you thought about going open source versus closed source and try to sell through your enterprises, all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the way you describe it, people want to try it. And when you're running, you know, software infrastructure, it's a very important piece of technology. And so people like to, poke with it. And then as soon as they start to do it on a greater scale, they want to be in touch with the company and they want to be in touch with the makers, make sure they can be helped if you know something goes wrong, make sure they can get security or, or your uptime guarantees and things like that. And that's when you enter into more of a commercial contract. Um, so as far as why we decided to go open source, two reasons, I would say. Um, one is you can get validation or invalidation on what you're doing much faster, right? Because a lot of people can say, hey, this is an interesting thing. It might not be mature enough to be adopted by the big company that I work at, but I want to follow along your project, right? They're sort of in the famous GitHub stars that people will talk about, right? right? Um, versus I see, I see it on decks too. I see it on pitch decks. We have a exactly. thousand GitHub stars and we got there in three months and that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously GitHub stars are a very, a very flawed indicator, but they're an indicator nonetheless, right? Of what do people think this is interesting? Um, and so I think they're an indicator more so for, for founders than for venture capitalists or angel investors. What, what, right? Yeah, let's, let's dig into the GitHub star thing really quick, just for, uh, for the audience. Like, you know, so I'm a developer and I really like your, your repo. So I star it. Is, is it a star like I'm giving it like a five out of five rating or am I starring it because I want to find it again and put it on a list or is it both? It's both in some ways. Like I think usually the main reason people start repos is because they want to track their progress. They might say like, this is interesting, right? Maybe they're using it today. Maybe they're, they're planning to use it eventually. Um, but they're like this, like, this is interesting. I see this being useful for whatever thing that I'm doing and people will decide to follow along. And so in some ways, um, the reason I was saying, I think it's mostly useful for founders is because I think a lot of founders try to use stars as like a metric for investors. And in some ways it works, but um, like when you're trying to make something, the biggest problem is, are you going to make something people want, right? Like the mm. previous company that I worked on, um, we did not make something people wanted and that's why it didn't work out, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it's, and, and the that, GitHub stars, like what, to what degree do you think it, it is showing, like if, if you were, an, imagine you're an investor and you see a deck, uh, what amount of stars at what rate or velocity would, would really impress you? Well, I think it depends. It depends a lot based on what you're making because, you know, like there's some things... wide ranging it is, like how widely applicable it is, things like that. Yeah, I think you got to use critical thinking. Like there are some tools that have 5,000 stars that are like truly, truly revolutionary in their spaces and, you know, make for phenomenal businesses. Like Citus, for example, in our space, which is a, a Postgres company, they sold to Microsoft for like nearly 300 million, I believe, 
uh, a few years ago, five years ago, maybe. And I think they had like 8,000 stories, which is, you know, a high amount, but it's not crazy. Like there's projects with 20, 30, 50, 60,000 stories, right? And on the, on the, on the opposite, I've seen projects with 30,000 stars that have like no paths to monetization and are great projects, but they're not a great company, right? Like really, that's why I said when people start something, they think it's interesting. Then after yeah. that, it's up to, you know, the makers and the investors to form a judgment on, okay, this is interesting. How is it interesting? Is it interesting mm. as, you know, a free project in the community? Is it interesting as a potential company? Is it interesting as something else? Um, and I think that's where, you know, information comes. But that's why I think it's useful as, as a founder, right? Because before I can go to a company and say, use my thing right, that I've made, that you need to trust me around, so on and so forth. Like now I can just say like, hey, I made this for free for everyone. Take a look and use it. Give me feedback early on, right? If there's a bug, you know, they can even fix it themselves sometimes and like contribute to the to the project. And meanwhile, myself, I can look at this and the engagement I'm seeing and, and try to use critical thinking and say, okay, does it feel like we're going into the direction of something that I think people will want? Do I have conviction that, you know, today it's not people that are paying because it's individual developers, but if we keep developing this, could it one day be big companies that do want to pay? And I think you can get feedback in when you're doing infrastructure, at least, uh, much faster in that way. And so that was one of the key reasons we picked open source. Um, the second one is just when you're building infrastructure, a lot of people expect it, to be honest. Like, you know, developers interact yeah. with infrastructure yeah. over code. And being able right. to see the code that they interact with is just more convenient, right? And so in a lot of ways... So how, so how do you think, protect yourself, you know, from copyright infringement if it's just if your code's just sitting out there? I mean, I think I know the answer, but for the audience, I'm going to ask the question. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways. I mean, the obvious one is people will use software licenses, right? That might seem silly, but as the maker of the software, you get to decide what rights you give to people to use it. A very common one people will give is essentially... Many licenses have a combination of you have the right to use it yourself for your own company, but you don't have the right to sell it to somebody else. So that's a very common one. So if you, Brian, want to make a project and use the software and it's like for you and your house or like for you and your company, you know, go ahead. It's free. It's up to you. But if you said like, I want to build a competitor to ParadeDB by selling ParadeDB, you would not be able to do that and you could be sued for it. Um, we also that call that the though, AWS tax, right? Isn't that the, the famous example where they for Was it... Uh, they forked one of the d databases and and made it a first party offering. They they've done that with a, with a few things like Elastic is one of the ones I'm very familiar with where they created Open Search out of it and started reselling it. Um, obviously, it's not very it's not very tactful, um, but AWS has so much leverage that they can do it. Um, the second thing I was going to say is even beyond licenses, a lot of it in the startup world I think is just speed of shipping. Like if I just do great work, right, and I do great work really quickly, it's difficult for people to to copy me, even with my own code. And people like to use software made by the makers of the product, right? Because if you're a company, what's actually hard, like it's hard to build software, but for a customer, it's it's hard to to operate software, right? You need to keep the servers up. Sometimes there's issues. Sometimes there's upgrades. Sometimes there's bugs, sometimes there are missing features. Those are all things that happen, right? And it costs money to operate software. And actually, that's a pain. And those companies, when they start using tools, even free ones, they want someone they can go and say, hey, like, I need you to fix this, right? Because we might have written, you know, 50,000 lines of code or something. They don't know the code. Like, our team knows the code. Our team is much more capable of fixing it than, like, a competitor who just decided to steal our software even, right? So even someone, like taking the software you make and trying to pass it as their own, they're offering a worse product because they're mm -hmm. not the makers. They don't understand it as well. They don't have the ability to, you know, to deliver on it as quickly. And so people tend to, you know, if you, you don't buy the fake AirPods, right? You buy the real AirPods or, you know, things like that. Like there's like some sort of quality associated with it in the making, right. but it also in the, in the distribution. And so even though it's open source, I would say, it's very rare for companies to get ripped off in, in such a way. Obviously, you have to be intentional about yeah, it. Yeah, I think, I think after AWS forked Elasticsearch, and I remember this whole thing, this whole fiasco, the, what was the licensing that uh, Elasticsearch was using? And, and they modified it afterwards, right? They did. Yeah, they made yeah. their own. They made their own called Elastic License 2, um, which basically says you can do anything except sell our own software, you know, because that's what AWS did. 
Um, the license they were using before, I do not remember which one, but it must have been one of the very, very permissive ones, like Apache. I think it was like the MIT one. Or MIT is a common, yeah. Yeah, the MIT one, I think, was what they're using. And then they, they're like, oof, now, because Amazon was able to kind of fork it and, and use it and, and legally win the battle there. And then so they had to go back and kind of, uh, cr- you know, change the licensing, more or less. Yeah, um, I think it's... I think it's a shame that this happened um, for a lot of for a lot of reasons, but fortunately, it's quite a rare occurrence. I would say people yeah. have been more careful about their licensing as a result. Like I would say, licenses can protect you against the big players like AWS, uh, but it doesn't protect you against the small players. Like it's just the quality of your work that protects you against other startups. Tell me more about that. Let's unpack that a bit um, because it's obvious if you know Amazon uses your your software and their software. Uh, because they're offering infrastructure, right? And then, but it's not so obvious when a small startup forks it and uses it and kind of integrates it into their code base. Well, I mean, it's kind of what I was saying before, right? Like they don't, they don't, they don't own it. They haven't made it. They don't understand it as well. And speed is everything for small companies, right? Yeah. You, can, you need to ship fast. You need to grow fast, and so on. And so, when you know. I would like to think that my team is able to execute on our own product faster than someone who has ripped it off, right? right. And yeah. if you take that, if you take that for granted, then it doesn't matter that other people are ripping it off because they're offering a worse product, and worse products lose in the long term, <laughs> right? I, lo- I if- love this distinction, right? Because like as a company, there's a lot of work you have to do to to, to create a, a, a piece of software like a SaaS company. And there's so much undifferentiated stuff in the stack that it's much, much better just to pay for it than to build it. That's kind of the point you're, I think you're driving at. Yeah, for the customers, yeah. Typically, it makes sense for people. I mean, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? It's right, cheaper, right. To, it's cheaper, cheaper to purchase a wheel than to Go down to the tire one. store and just buy the tires, right? <laughs> yeah. Try to make your own tires at home, you know, using the rubber plant or whatever. However the exactly. <laughs> like, there's, there's obviously, you know, like um, exceptions to this, especially big companies will oftentimes rebuild certain things so it fits perfectly for their systems. But for the vast majority of people, it doesn't make sense. I love that. So uh, tell us more about, you know, how you guys monetize then. So you got this open source out there. There's lots of, you know, th- thousands of developers probably using it at this point. You know, it's, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, the South Park episode where the, 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 the gnomes steal the socks out of the dryer, you know? I, I'm not That's, familiar. Anyway. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, you get the, but, you get this great package out there. People are starring it, and now how do you monetize, right? Because people can just use it for free. Yeah, but again, again, like this is what I was mentioning before. It's it's actually costly to operate software, right? You're not using it for free. Like you're using it for free, maybe versus me, but you need to pay salary to an engineer on your team to like spin it up, right? And then whenever it goes down. Or whenever you know there's some issue with the servers or whatever, you need to pay an engineer on your team to take care of it, right? And so yeah. that person, they might be using 20, 30, 50, 100 percent of their time, like actually running this, and that costs a ton of money. Software engineers are expensive, right? Yep. So it's not free. Like nothing is free, even if you don't pay <laughs> the makers. Right. And so as a result, um, this is where companies like ours make money, right? We make money in that cost. What I can say is, into a company instead of going and paying a software engineer $200,000 to go and run my software, pay me $100,000 and I'll run it for you, right? And by the way, What do you think that trade-off is actually, like when you think about value capture, um, typically like pricing in pricing theory uh, states, you should capture about 30% of the value you create of uh, enterprise value. Um, How do you guys think about the pricing of like time saved and, and stuff like that? I think it's much more an art than a science, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I think it depends so much. It depends so much based on what product you're making, right? Like the options people have and so on. Um, for us, I mean, we don't, we don't monetize yet. So for us, we are thinking through that trade off. Um, yeah. and then we'll like put it into practice over, over this year as we go into monetization. But, um, I think the the art of like where you want to end up is when someone sees your product they're like oh that's kind of expensive but i really need it you know yeah, yeah. like like right in that kind like, of you edge know, of like uh feels kind of expensive but i really need it and i'll i'll, I'll still buy it versus like it's exa- too expensive i'll just pay an engineer to figure it out 
Exactly. So it has to be like, you, that's when you know you're capturing maximum value, right? When they're like, when they, there's a thought that it's expensive, but they still have to go forward with it. Mm. Like a lot of companies do very well at this. Like yeah. Apple is probably a very good example, right? Mm. People are like, ah, oh, like this Apple laptop is expensive, but like, ah, you know, I still want to buy yeah, it. It's a $500 right? then, watch, but I really want it still. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. there's like something, you know, unique that it has. And there's, you know, there's tons of products that, that do very well at this. And there's, yeah. but if you, if you go at it, you know, and you're like, this is a bargain, like this discount, like this is so cheap. Then whoever's making this is like way under, under pricing. Yeah. So tell but us about your, yeah. So tell us about your, your, uh, previous startup and kind of what it was and kind of lessons learned and wh why you shut it down and all that stuff. Sure. So, so our previous company was called West. We were, um, we were building a cloud-based web browser. So. You know, when you open up your Chrome or your Safari or whatever, um, you can open up a tab and then you have a button to open up an incognito tab, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially what we did is we created this Chrome-like browser that also had a third tab option where you could open up what we call the cloud tab. And a cloud tab was a tab where the the actual like content of the web page was rendered in, in the cloud on the machine. It was streamed to you like a video, similar to yeah. Netflix. Yeah. Right? And then whenever you would, you would take actions, we would send back your clicks to the server. And the benefits for this were two folds. One was um, for for graphic intensive web pages. Um, we could run this on a graphics card in the cloud, and it would be faster than running it on your MacBook. Um, and the second one is cyber is uh, cybersecurity benefits, where all the code execution would happen remotely, and you would only see an image on your local machines. So there would be some security guarantees for your for you know enterprise data. This is all in theory. In practice. Um, both of these benefits were quite marginal and there were better ways to achieve both of these benefits. And so the product we built was very technically involved and very interesting to build, but it didn't solve a really pressing need. It was like solving a, like not a hair on fire problem for people, yeah. I would say. Yeah. And so we, we spent a long time working on it, way too long. We spent three years, we raised four and a half million dollars. We, um, wow. We, at some point we were a team of 22, 21, 22, something people, which is way too many for, you know, the amount of customers we had, um, we made a million mistakes, but after some time and a lot of iteration in the space, we realized we frankly weren't solving like a big enough problem and mm. decided that, you know, this was a bit of a lost cause towards the end of it. We started doing more cybersecurity, which was a better market, but we, it wasn't really our passion. And so we decided, you yeah. know, this is. We were kind of at the end of the journey. Uh, we felt like it was time to, you know, to, to do something else. So we closed the company. Down. Interesting. So it kind of towards yeah. the end, you're kind of like, feel like you're pushing out on a rope. It's kind of like, we just can't get, we can't find the, we have this great uh, technical product, but yeah. Is it a big enough problem? Are people willing to pay for this? Um, what kind of revenue did you, did you guys get to before you shut it down? Oh, we made, I don't know, a few thousand bucks. It was almost, it was nothing. Wow. So you raised yeah, a few million to... and only got to like a few thousand dollars of revenue. Um, we did month. not find any form of PMS. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So like, yeah, as an investor, I typically will invest post launch, post revenue. And if, for that reason, right? Because a lot of my, I look back at all my portfolio companies and a lot of the best ones, they had that PMF and the way you can tell, honestly, it's just traction, right? It's just like, Oh, well you just doubled uh, revenue well... th three months in a row, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, like, like part of me, but I'll have to, to push on this a little bit more. I think when PMF is found, it's a much easier decision to invest, obviously, because the evidence is there. I think the best, like the really, really best investments is if you can have the conviction to find people that you think will, like you're very confident will get PMF yeah. before it. And then yeah. you invest at a much lower rate. The problem, the problem for us is that, um, I think we were not mature enough in our startup journey to be those people. Right? Yeah. We tried really, really hard. Like I cannot describe how hard we worked to try to make it there, but we worked in very, unfortunately, very inefficient ways. And many, many lessons learned that we're now applying to pre yeah. and things are going, you know, so much faster, so much better. Um, but I think it's possible, you know, with enough conviction to like invest pre PMF. And I think those make the best deals, right? But they're I also to, much I, more yeah, risky. Yeah, I have, I have, I, I kind of look for like, you know, it's definitely has to be post launch, post rev, um, or, you know, in, in some cases, like, you know, we're an investor with you guys. So it was obviously pre monetization, but you know, there was a lot of traction there. Right. And so I think, um, 
Yeah, there's no rule of thumb, right? Every investment's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's always exceptions. Nice... Like it's like it's like uh, strong opinions weekly held is how I would describe venture capital. It's like I have a lot of strong yeah. opinions, but I I make exceptions all the time. Um, and so, th- um, yeah. for your first startup, did you go through any kind of accelerator? Sort of, not really. Um, we we didn't do YC. We were funded early on by Neo. Maybe you've heard of them by now. Um, Neo dot so. com. Yeah. yeah, they're a little bit less lower profile, but they're they're this VC fund uh, that also has this sort of tech community. They recruit heavily out of out of colleges, um, like the ones that me and my co-founder went to, and they now have an incubator that's essentially a competitive incubator to Y Combinator. Um, it's called the Neo Accelerator, and um, we were funded by them at a pre-seed the year prior to them launching the incubator. Mm. So we were kind of part of the you know, internal beta version, if you will. We didn't really do an incubator, but we had something a little approximated and then eventually they launched a proper incubator and now I believe it's like very high quality and, and, and high scale. But um what well, back then though. So to answer your question, no, but kind of <laughs> Yeah. And then so what um so with the second company, what made you apply to YC? Yeah, we applied to YC for um for a few reasons, for three reasons. Um a big one was I'm not, I'm Canadian, right? I'm not American and um, I need a visa to do startups in the United States. YC, fortunately, um, carries big weight in helping people get a visa for entrepreneurship. Oh, nice. And yeah, and so that, that really helped me get a new visa and come back to the US. After we shut down our first company, I had to leave because my visa is associated with my previous job. Mm-hmm. So that's one. Um, that being said, we didn't do YC purely for the utilitarian reason here. Uh, there were two main reasons. One is we wanted to be in, like, we wanted to grow our startup community, right? Like, there's great people in YC, obviously. Yeah. Um, we were hoping to meet new people that would challenge us in different ways. Um, and the second one is we we really liked how pragmatic YC was. In the first company, we made a lot of mistakes, sort of getting caught in the weeds that things that didn't matter. Like, we hadn't made something people want, and we were worrying about plenty of other company building related things which in hindsight were way too early. And YC is very pragmatic, right? They're like, you know, shut up and like build something people want, right? And once (laughs) you have something people want, we'll talk again and we'll figure out what to do then. But first you got to do that. And Mm. we thought going through YC would help us become more like that. And that was what we associated as the biggest mistake we made in our previous company. And we really wanted to make sure we wouldn't make it again. And I think that's largely proven to be true. We've, we've taken a lot from from yc and feel very grateful for what they did for us that's amazing uh what are some of the the things that they taught you that you wish you knew on the on the first startup uh yeah that's a good question i mean the thing with startup lessons is they feel so obvious in hindsight and yet you somehow need to kind of make the mistake or be told like 50 times to really do it (laughs) which is like so silly you kind of need to go yeah people will tell you what to do and it's really good advice. And then you won't do it. You'll do something else. And then you get pounded over the head with the with the lesson. And you're like, gosh, I should have listened. Yeah, I totally know what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. So like, I mean, what, like, YC, you know, they tell you um, launch really quickly, right? Like find the fastest way to launch. Like our first company, we were building this browser, right? And I had the product went a few iterations before it was a browser. And each time it took us several, several months to go and build something because we were using very complicated technology. And honestly, the more difficult it was to do, the more validated we felt that it must be valuable, which is mm. not true, right? Mm. And so we would work on something really hard for several months, make progress. And then after like six months, eight months, we would eventually release it. And then people would be like, yeah, we don't want this. And mm. we're like, well, well, that's not how this was supposed to go. Like, did you, you know, this <laughs> yeah. this is not a plan. I just we work like, hard on this. Like, this is technically very difficult, and you should find value in this. Don't you find value like, in this? Look at look at look at this. Look at what we built. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And versus YC, they were like, look, like just what is like trim every piece that could take any amount of time and just launch something, and then see what people think, right? And so the first version of what became Parade DB that we launched, like. Honestly, I think we built it in like a week, if not even less, right? And like it was minuscule in its set of features, of course, right? Yeah. But what very minuscule pain point it could solve, like it did solve, right? Mm. And so we sent it to a few people and like a few people started using it. It was like a handful, three, four, I think, comp- small companies 
uh, small startups using it. But already those people came up to us with ideas. They're like, oh, now I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that, right? Mm. And then before we knew it, we were kind of on the path, right? And yeah. following that journey, we started. And so eventually, like now the product contains nothing of the first thing we launched. But that yeah. first thing we launched helped us, you know, progress to where it is today. Um, so I think that's a really big thing that YC did for us. That yeah. uh, was a mistake we made in the first company. Another big it's one. It's just having the radical, the radical customer focus is, is like in, in product. I built a lot of products over the years that nobody used. And I, I slowly learned. I was like, I need to work back to the tech from the customer. Yeah. And, and really, really just like, oh, we have this target audience. Let's go figure out what problems they have and really, really build something as quickly as possible that solves those problems and then keep iterating on instead of going into our corner and building something for three months and then saying, hey, look at what we built. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so that was a big one for us. Another one that YC does is they incentivize, or at least they, they try to push you to stay very, very low, um, you know, low burn, low, like very low maintenance, maybe like until you have found something people want, right? Because mm. otherwise people get distracted. And that's what happened to us. Like we raised money, we were going to raise less, we got kind of pushed into raising more. And, um, you know, at the time we thought that was great. And in many ways it was, but then we had a ton of money. And so, you know, you have to spend it. So we hired people, right? But a lot of those people at some point, we were like confused in our product direction. And now we had a bunch of people working for us. We wanted to pivot in some ways, but then mm. what would we tell the people, right? It's harder to pivot when you have a lot of people. Um, and we started, yeah. you know, like we, like we got ourselves an office, right? And things like that. Yeah, versus you have YC's this org like, is that you're responsible for and everybody has this mission and it's 20 people and there's exactly. an inertia that happens with, with that kind of size where, and that's generally kind of still a small company, but uh yeah you have this inertia and this idea of like what you should be selling and doing and building and um i love seeing the yc updates um from companies that are kind of they're still kind of pre-product market fit and i can tell because their runways are like 50 months yeah <laughs> you know so they're like they're keeping their burn super super low until they find they find that thing that feature set that that collection of things that people just can't live without and 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 then and I've seen I've seen this happen o over and over again. And there's really famous examples in industry. I think um, like Notion. Notion went out, back and just kept their burn low, really small team for like two or three years, trying to figure out like what's the set of features that people really want, and didn't try yeah. to sell it. And they just kind of you know, and then and then turned on the hockey stick growth. And there's lots of examples of that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Anyways, all this to say, those were two really nice things that I mm -hmm. think YC helped us hone in on, and um, we try to carry forward as we as we try to grow. That's awesome. So, what's your um, switching to like a rapid fire to, to kind of wrap things up? Um, what's one technology you can't live without? Uh, Postgres. <laughs> Anything? Uh, in my, pers in my personal, yeah, personal life? life. Let's go personal life. Yeah. In my personal life, technology I can live without. Um, I would say Spotify. I just mm. listen to too many audiobooks and music. I I learn a lot that way, and I decompress that way. Yeah, I love to listen to audiobooks. I I use Audible, but um, I switched to YouTube Music because I'm already paying for YouTube Red, and I really mm. miss Spotify. I think Spotify is just uh, I just like their user interface better. Everything about That's it's so better. Good. I I think YouTube has pretty good mixes of music. Um, but they're just uh. I don't know. The algorithm on Spotify, I think it's a little better for finding the music I like. Mm. Um, if you weren't doing Parade DB, what would you be doing? I would probably be working at a startup I believe in somewhere else. Like, yeah, I would, I would try to be an early employee at a startup I believe in. That's, the, that's really good advice. That's generally what I tell people. If you don't know what to build for the world, go work for somebody that's building the thing you want to build in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. I agree. Are you an early bird or a night owl? I'm usually an early bird. What's that like? <laughs> it's I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's not different. It's just shifted. It's not yeah. different. What's a book that significantly influenced uh, how you think and 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 how you run your uh, your business? Um, there's there's many. The most recent one is this book that I read by Annie Duke called Quit 
Um, mm. I read it last year. I would highly recommend it. It's, um, it's a book to encourage you to quit the things you're doing. And I think it's very paradoxical because people always think like, you know, people always say like, you know, never give up and then reach your dreams. But I think there's a big, um, there's something important to decide, which is like, are you working on the thing worth working on? Like if you're working on the right thing, yeah. you should not give up. Right. But right. if you're working on the wrong thing, you should quit. Right. And I think that was a mistake we made at Parade DB, uh, sorry, at Wist. Um, yeah. we were working, we were working really, really hard on the wrong thing. And no matter how hard we would work, it would never work. Right. And, you know, quitting freed us to have time and energy to move on to something else and something that's more likely to work and then work really hard on that now. Right. And yeah. so I think, um, I think great people, like great leaders, great athletes and, you know, whatever in every profession, people who are great, they quit a lot, much more mm. than people think. I think it's important to know how to quit. I have quit more jobs than I care to admit. Like I literally, mm -hmm. my career is full of failure and I've quit jobs after days, weeks, months. Um, you know, I, I, when I washed out of wall street, you know, in my mid twenties, I just, I went through a series of like, you know, just wandering through jobs, you know, just trying things, just throwing, throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what, what would stick and, and not, and not finding anything. And it took a long time to a, a lot of quitting uh, to find the thing that I really love, love to do, you know? So that's, I think that's yeah, great it, advice. It's uh it's an important part of the journey. It is. Yeah. A lot of failure. Um, so what's, uh, you know, last question, what's one piece of advice that you'd give a potential and future tech entrepreneurs? A piece of advice to future tech entrepreneurs. Well, I think I am, you know, in some ways a future tech entrepreneur. I feel very <laughs> early in the journey. So I don't know if I'm in place to give advice, but I think the best one that I would give is like work on things that you find exciting. Mm. Right. I think like the best ideas start from people finding something exciting, then they work on it. And as they work on it, they like shape the idea into something more and more ambitious and, you know, grows bigger scale, right? Like all the really big companies that people always toss around, like the big techs and so on. They were started that way, right? People thought something was cool. They worked on it for fun. And eventually other people thought it was cool and look where it got them. And I think this is kind of what we're trying to do with Parade DB and Usually, like when I see people get more and more excited as they work on something, I feel very confident that it's something that's probably going to go in a good direction. Love that. Well, Philippe, thanks so much for coming on. This was a great conversation. I'm sure our audience will derive much, much benefit from it. Yeah, thanks for having me.